Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Cybersecurity Standards Scorecard 2021 edition. My name is Jennifer Lynn of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's feature speaker is James Tarala, SANS Senior Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Please notice that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of the webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our presenter. Great, thank you, Jennifer, appreciate that. So like Jennifer said, my name is James Trolla. I'm one of the SANS senior instructors. I've had the opportunity to be an instructor and course author here for almost 20 years at SANS. And today what I want to do is I want to give the first of hopefully, which is going to be a series of webcasts that we'll do over the coming years, looking at cybersecurity standards and, and really trying to better understand the landscape around these standards specifically. Uh, this is a 2021 edition. Uh, what we're hoping to do is do this hopefully on an annual basis uh, to talk a little bit more details about what these cybersecurity standards uh, are all about uh, and some of the comparisons that are there. But what I want to start with is, is this, sort of this, this comment. Uh, I had an opportunity to, to talk with other SANS faculty about this and some other researchers in the space. And, and for a lot of years, I, I've heard these comments from people that cybersecurity standards are basically all the same, that you pick one, you stick with it, you just do what it says, and kind of regardless of whatever you pick, the flavors might be a little bit different, but at the end, you basically achieve the same thing. And I think we all recognize that if we look around right now, uh, I know I've been able to count well over you know, 50, if not closer to 100 cybersecurity standards uh, that have been published, whether it be law, whether it be just uh, general standards or industry regulations that happen to be out there. But there are literally dozens of these standards that we can potentially pull from. And, and there is this general belief that I, I've heard from people repeatedly that these standards are basically the same. So if you choose the NIST cybersecurity framework or you look at ISO 27002 or whatever it is that you happen to like, that basically if you just do what's inside, you'll, you'll be doing the same thing. And the more that I've had an opportunity to work in this space, the more that I recognize this, this could not be further from the truth. Uh, these standards are not the same. Uh, they are not created equal. Uh, they don't have the same resourcing behind them. And I think it's important for us to evaluate these a little and understand what's being offered to us and maybe uh, make more intelligent decisions in the process. Uh, many of you may have uh, met me in the past. Uh, my background is to actually um, had the opportunity to work with a lot of these standards for a number of years. Um, most notably, I've, I've been working with the SANS Institute, but also Center for Internet Security um, on the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls since that project started back in 2008 and had the opportunity to serve as one of its uh, authoring editors for a number of years. Um, also, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of a project that I've been working on since COVID started, uh, the Collective Controls Catalog and the Collective Risk Project. Um, I've been had the privilege of being uh, one of the, the founders and, and uh, core authors of that as well. So hopefully I can bring some of those experiences uh, to the conversation today. Uh, and that's really what's motivated me uh, to do this research into this information we have here. So long story short is, is as we, we get into this conversation, I know that a lot of you are in a situation where you're trying to make decisions on what are the right things that you should be doing to defend yourself. So we understand that there's a lot you can study in cybersecurity. You can learn pen testing and you can learn auditing and you can learn management skills and different things. But one of the core competencies a lot of us have to have is just that ability to make a decision to say, what are the good things that I should be doing to be able to defend my organization? And, and the, the thing that a lot of us will do, of course, is we're not going to come up with this on our own. Now, ideally, we could talk about risk management strategies and we could all talk about, all right, we're going to look at some threat inventories and by understanding the bad things that could happen to us, we could try to map those to things we could do to stop those bad things from happening. And, and theoretically, it all sounds great. In reality, nobody really does that. Um, and, and I say no one, I mean, probably less than 1% of the population really actually does that. And that's probably a conversation for a different day. And uh, if you want to look a little bit more into the collective risk project, you know, certainly we can talk a little bit more about that at a later date. But the reality is, is we're still faced with this problem. The problem is, how do we decide what are the things we should actually do? What's that list to make sure we're doing the right things to defend ourselves? And like I said, the goal of this webcast series is that this is gonna be something that we're gonna look at on an annual basis, is we're gonna look at some of the most popular standards that are out there. Uh, we may add more and more standards to this um, as time goes on, um, but we wanna look at the most popular and look at a series of evaluation criteria to try to understand how do these relate to each other? What are the pros and the cons of some of these cybersecurities that are out there? 
So I want to do a couple things. I want to be able to also present you a methodology for evaluating the standards themselves. Now, it doesn't mean you have to use the research that I have here. If you want to tweak the criteria or look at different cate uh, categories or characteristics that you want to put into the conversation, that's awesome. But I want to propose a theory for how we go about doing this. You may have different goals and some of the things that I've scored here may not be important to you. And so maybe you want to adjust the methodology. So maybe what you do is you take this as a starting point and then you tweak the dials a little bit, you turn dials a little bit and adjust for what your needs might be. Maybe you say, you know what, James, we're not really worried about privacy this year. So the fact that you've included privacy as a criteria, you know what, it's not real important to us at this time. So maybe you take that out or maybe you say, no, it's, it's more important. And maybe you wanna weight these in some way. Well, again, then you can do that too. But ultimately what we're trying to do is give you an opportunity to make an intelligent decision how to choose to defend yourself. That's what this is all about. So that's the conversation we're trying to have. So if you look at what are the controls that we evaluated in this year's study, you can see them on the screen here. And so we, we looked at a few of those standards that are in place. Um, you'll notice, for example, the CIS controls, we did include both version 7.1 and version 8. Uh, there was a pretty big um, philosophical change between those two versions. So we wanted to reflect that here. Uh, we also, again, just sort of near and dear to our heart and certainly near and dear to the SANS community. So we wanted to sort of include those as people are considering that transition to version eight. Um, we use for the most part, um, the, the most recent version of a lot of these standards. Uh, I actually did the, the research before PCI 3.2.1 came out. So we'll reflect that in next year's standard or whatever the latest version is when that comes out. Um, we'll also put in um, probably MITRE's Defend in future versions. Um, it really still was in beta when we did this work. So um, we use our enterprise mitigations instead, which is directly tied to attack, um, but likely in the future as Defend and others start to become more popular, we may include that as well. But this is what we started with. So you can kind of see some of those ideas. And certainly, you know, this is a moving target. Probably a lot of you saw the news about CMNC this week and the Pentagon's changes there. So, you know, there, this is going to be a work in progress. But basically, at least once a year, we're going to update this with the research, the data that we have, and we'll go ahead and make adjustments as necessary. Now, specifically, if you look at what are the criteria we use to compare these standards, uh, you'll see those listed out. And so what we tried to do is we said, we wanted to treat this almost like a threat model uh, in the sense where we wanted to come up with characteristics, criteria that we could use and be able to say, okay, what are those things that we would want to be in a good standard? Like what are those characteristics? What are those qualities that we would expect to be there? And so you can see, first of all, uh, we looked at different types of controls, um, things like operational controls, governance controls, uh, technical controls, uh, we wanted to know if these were going to be updated recently, uh, was it an old standard, um, not to pick on anyone, but look at like ISO, for example, ISO 27002 hasn't been updated since 2013, right? So that's an eight-year gap. Obviously, that's a little concerning. Now, granted, they're in the process of doing an update right now, but when they release a new version, then we'll include that and put that into our criteria as well. But that recentness, uh, we did ask if it was a community-driven effort. Um, we included that because what we've discovered is a lot of these standards, and again, not to pick on people, but especially um, on some of the government side, the NIST side, and some of these tend to be closed communities or, or walled gardens where people are doing work in, in a bit of a vacuum and sort of a small group or small committee. And maybe they're taking feedback from the community, but there may only be, in many cases, three, four, five people in the world actually making a decision about a given control set. And that's actually much more common than people realize, is that a lot of these standards really are just a group of people, maybe five, six people sitting around a table, ultimately making a lot of these decisions. So whether this is an open development process or community driven, that, that was to me was something that was important I wanted to measure. Uh, we also looked at Google Trends. Uh, we'll show some data on that, just so you can understand a little bit about the popularity of given standards. I just thought that was an interesting conversation. We'll get some examples of that here in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to know, did the standard map threats to controls. So if these are control libraries, do we see an open clear mapping between the threats that were that were evaluated and the controls that were selected? Um, not to uh, spoil anything, but you're going to find most all standards don't do that. Um, very, very few standards actually do mappings like that. Um, and most all most definitely don't publish that information. So um, that's a lot harder exercise than people realize, uh, but it turns out that's lacking in most standards these days. Um, we also wanted to look at modern threats. Uh, so things you would think about, right? Ransomware issues, uh, some of the identity issues, credential stuffing, right? All those things that you would sort of expect to see um, addressed in a standard. 
Um, sometimes what you find is that people are, are evaluating these standards or deciding on control sets that frankly haven't been involved in the industry for a long time, or maybe aren't aware of some of the recent tools or techniques that are out there to be able to defend yourself. So we wanted that to be part of our criteria as well. Um, we wanted the mapping between a standard and other standards to be part of this. Uh, we also wanted to know if, uh, the applicability. Uh, a lot of times what I find is organizations are in a very specific situation. Uh, a lot of my clients, for example, are energy clients and they wanna know, all right, do industrial control systems or SCADA systems, um, are, they, are these controls applicable in that environment to like an OT or operational technology space? Uh, how do these apply, apply to cloud or specifically how do they apply to software as a service, right? Those kinds of questions. So a lot of times uh, these are gen, uh, general or more generic standards and my question wanted to be then, all right, do we have particular applicability between the standard and some of those um, particular topics like we see there? I also wanted to know, was this internationally applicable? Uh, a lot of times people view these as just US standards or European standards or things like that. So I wanted international applicability or international implementation uh, to be part of the conversation. Some of these tend to be more internationally driven uh, or at least generally accepted. Uh, I wanted to know if there was control prioritization listed uh, in other words, do we have a guidance that says, here's 100 or 200 things that you should do, all right, but do these first, right? Or if you can only do 20 of these things, do these 20. So was that part of the conversation? Uh, and again, not to spoil it, most don't. Um, and then also I said, was there a corresponding measures or metrics guide? In other words, here's a list of the good things to do, but how do we validate that we're actually doing those things? Uh, is there a guide that's out there to help facilitate opening the door for automation, continuous monitoring, uh, maybe building this into a more um, governance risk compliance or GRC engine type product uh, to help us automate risk scoring in these areas? Uh, so we'll look at that. The grading score that you'll see on the right there are the scores and the numbers that I used um, on a five point scale to be able to evaluate. I understand a lot of this is sort of US centric from a grading standpoint. So I wanted people to be able to see that, uh, but it's a common way to, to explain this information. So I used um, grading like you'd see in a US school system, but basically what you'll see there is you had to achieve at least that number to get that letter grade. Uh, so that's the scoring that I used. Uh, so the five point scale, as you don't see five, right? So if you're at a 4.66 or higher, um, up to five, you'd get that A plus grade. And then sort of you had to at least hit that number in order to get the score that's there. Um, and that was especially useful when doing the aggregate or overall scores for each standard. So uh, we'll go ahead and present that at the very end though. So you'll see that at the end, but, but these are the numbers that I use. So if you're kind of wondering behind the scenes how I came up with those, you're gonna see a lot of the actual scoring for specific, uh, specific areas. Um, in the future, we might um, be able to publish more on the rubric that we use. Uh, for the sake of time, we didn't have time to do that here today, but probably down the road, we'll have um, maybe some supplementary guidance or something we can give out to show those rubrics we use for each of these scores. Now, the other thing that we did as part of this was we had to use a baseline for controls. And you're gonna see this in a graph in a little while. And so what we had to do is we had to say, all right, if we're evaluating different control categories, we said we need a baseline to basically say, these are all the potential things that could have been discussed in a particular category, right? So we needed something to compare against. So one of the research projects that we did at the beginning of COVID was we tried to create that baseline. And, and we basically said, this is a free project. And if you do a Google search on collective control catalog, uh, right now it's being hosted over at auditscripts.com. I just have a place to put it um, under free resources there. Um, but this is something we are going to be in the process, most likely, of having a dedicated site for just because we have so many contributors. We want everyone to have a chance to um, share information on this. But what we did was we took about 40 different cybersecurity standards and we literally sort of listed them out on a detailed basis. Um, all the controls, everything all those standards asked you to do, we normalized that data and came up with about 400 statements that were being asked from all of those different guides, including all the different standards that we're, we see here um, in the presentation. And so that list of 400 statements or controls, what we did is we used that for the baseline when we compared individual standards against something. Like we had to have that foundation. And so this was a control baseline that we used. Now, we're not saying all these controls are things you should all do. Um, there is some guidance we'll talk about a little bit later as far as prioritizing these controls and such. We just wanted to have a comprehensive list. So if we said, if we wanted to be compliant with all of these 40 different standards that, that we have in this list, what are all the things we would have to do? 
And roughly that came to about 400 statements of things you would need to do to be compliant with all of those different standards. So that became sort of our baseline. Now, we did this sort of not in a vacuum. Um, thankfully, we have a lot of really good folks helping us on this project. Uh, so you can see some of those people that are here. Uh, obviously, the Sands Institute is a great uh, help for all of these projects. So they're just a great location for research in these areas. Uh, the Institute of Applied Network Security has been very helpful sort of as a sounding board for this. Um, Enclave and the folks over at Audit Scripts, um, and certainly where I'm coming from, a lot of the folks on my team um, help participate in this. I'm uh, really thankful for uh, John Strand, uh, CJ Cox, Brian Strand, everyone over at uh, Black Hills Information Security, um, just for encouraging this effort. And, um, and Cisco, frankly, and uh, other companies have been great just about reviewing this, um, sort of getting behind it, sort of you know, making sure we're on the right track. So really appreciate sort of just this community involvement. And in fact, going forward, this is kind of an important thing for me, is that this is really it's designed to be a collective effort. It's designed to be something we all contribute to, to hopefully give us better data uh, about how we can uh, work together uh, to solve some of these challenges. So what we did was we, we got started. And like I said, we, we started by simply trying to say, what are all of those good things potentially that we could do? And so I, I said that roughly it was a little over 2000 items in all of these 40 standards. And so what we started with is, as many of you know, a lot of these standards are just PDF guides, right? Or websites or whatever they might be. So what we did is we got our interns to help us and. Uh, we went through and we basically said, let's take every control statement, um, the ID field for it, where it came from, and let's put that into a spreadsheet. So we originally put this into a SQLite database, but it ended up being a little unwieldy to pull queries from easily. So we just brought it over to Excel to make life easy. Um, so we started there. And roughly what that did was we found that there was about 2,000 statements from all of these different standards uh, that I'm referencing here. And, um, and you can, again, you can download this over at Audit Scripts if you want to go ahead and pull the full, the full list of controls that are here. Then what we did was we went through and we tagged each of these statements with the control system that we said we thought we would need in place in order to do this good thing. And so in other words, we thought, okay, what was the thing that we would need to do to buy? Like, would we buy, you know, endpoint detection response? Would we buy a log management system? Would we buy... Oh, I don't know, an email filtering solution. Like what would be the thing you would buy to make this thing possible? And so sometimes there were maybe program statements or policy statements too, like we had to include those. But, but we went through and we tagged all of those thousands of things. And you know, I've seen different organizations trying to do this with AI and uh, trying to do this with like basically keyword searches and things like that. But honestly, th there's a lot of errors to be introduced in that process. And we just didn't want to do this. We wanted this to be a one-time event. We wanted this to be something that we knew was solid because it would be the foundation of a lot of this other work we're doing. So we didn't want to introduce the idea for any potential errors to show up here. So we actually went through that as a manual process. We, we didn't do any sort of keyword searches or anything like that. That to me had too much potential for error. So we did this as a manual effort. Uh, we had manual reviews of it to make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, and then once those control systems were defined, then what we did was we went through and we categorized each of the systems. So we came up with like, oh, I don't know, maybe about 10 or so um, different uh, control categories that each of those control systems would fit into. And you'll see why that's important here in a minute when we start graphing this out. Then once we had all this done, then what we did is we have, so again, now we have a couple thousand different statements. So what we did was we then consolidated, normalized those statements into those 400 or so statements, uh, which you can see there on the left, for instance. So we went through and we wrote our own individual statements to say, this would be the thing, the good thing you would need to do. And then you can see on the right, what we did was then we mapped it at a very specific level to exactly which statements in each of those standards would map back to doing that good thing. Now, sometimes it was big, right? I mean, sometimes these mappings aren't one-to-one, -one, they're close, right? Or they're, they're sort of a gray space that's there. So what we tried to do is we tried to be as literal as possible, but the big goal that we always had when we did this is we said, if you do that statement, like you see governance statement number one, for example, at the top of the list, if you do that thing, what would you achieve? And it was our opinion that if you did that good thing, our team said that then you would be compliant with those specific statements that you'll see on the right. 
And we sort of had to cut it off because frankly, there wasn't enough room on a slide, but uh, of course it slides all the way to the right to, for, for all the standards to show up in there. And you know, a lot of those standards are, you know, you'll see the NIST standards and ISO, and you have Australian standards and French standards and you know, just all kinds of things sort of thrown in there. But we wanted to be as comprehensive as we could. And, and as new control standards come out, we're adding them into this and we reevaluate this list based on the new standard that's in there. So for example, when the CIS controls version eight came out, uh, we went through a whole effort and put them into this process. And I think we ended up adding two or three statements. Um, it wasn't a lot, but there were two or three statements we added um, into the control list on the left that you'll see there based on the new things that were coming up um, as a result of those controls. So what we're gonna look at next then is, so I say all that and explain that foundation because that served as the foundation for what I'm about to show you. And, and that's the important part because we had to do this to get ourselves sort of situated. So what we did was I want to go through one at a time now and look at these individual standards and the grades that we gave. I'm gonna, this is gonna be front loaded in the sense that I'll probably spend a little bit more time explaining it in the beginning. And then as we get near, we go through a couple of these, I'm gonna go through much faster, but I wanna show you a couple of examples. So the first example we have here are the CIS controls, right? So Center for Internet Security, Critical Security Controls, and this is in particular version 7.1. And I'll do both 7.1 and 8 so you can see the differences that are there. So on the left there in the chart, these are basically those categories. And these are the controls that we identify. All right, so these are those control areas. So remember I said, if I go back a couple slides here, remember I said on the right, you'll see control category. So where we went through and categorized each of those statements that are there, those statements you'll see under control category are the categories that we see here, okay? So these represent a series or a list of good things that could potentially be done. And what we see is that far right-hand line um, is 100%. So that is the highest. So in other words, if you look at like asset inventory and control on this slide, for example, you'll see it's a relatively green bar and it's just shy of 100%, that far line. Um, so basically what that's saying is that particular category the CIS controls have basically said almost 100% of the things that we would find in a baseline or a, good, a series of good controls specifically for uh, asset inventory and control. So you can see that sort of all the way um, across there. So that, that's what you see there. Now, what I tried to do too is we, we gave a percent scale and I, I won't bother you with the details on that, but we did have a percent scale to keep these consistent and to keep the colors consistent. Uh, that way you could sort of see these all lined up against each other. Uh, and so you can see that sort of tied into this as well. So anyway, so you can see looking at something like, like just here, the CIS controls, there's always been sort of this conversation that the CIS controls were designed to be more of a technical toolkit, right? More technical things to do to be able to defend yourself. In fact, that was one of the early philosophies of the project. So it just makes sense that you'll see a lot of green bars on the more technical items and the red bars tend to represent more governance issues, right? More operational issues, which to be fair, were considered out of scope for the most of the CIS controls. Now, that being said, there were always operational controls that snuck in there some, sometimes. So you, it, it is greater than zero and you do see those red bars, um, but th that doesn't mean it's bad, right? It just means that's the scope that this particular control, just, they decided to follow. All that means to us then is when we're evaluating these side by side, if I'm trying to come up with a comprehensive set of controls that I need to put in place, to me, there's sort of four pillars that are here. We've got governance controls, we have operational controls, we have technical controls, we have privacy controls, and these are all going to be important for us. And I know people like to talk about things like people process technology, and if you want to lay, overlay that, that's fine. I'm not a huge fan of that statement, though. I, I try not to say that ever, because um, I just don't know that it makes a lot of sense, to be honest. But the, the pillars that I tend to, tend to bring into this conversation, again, I'll say it again, governance, operations, technical, privacy. And, and so you're going to see that some of these standards address a particular area more than others. And a lot of you have probably heard me say the statement that people have a tendency to, to talk about the controls that they're comfortable with, right? The control categories are comfortable with. I'll be honest, I'm not a privacy guy. Uh, that's not been my main focus over the years. Uh, there are a lot of other people that are out there. Uh, Kelly Tall, for example, who, I mean, that's her topic. That's her focus, right? And there's people like that that we can rely on and go to for good information, but that's not my thing. So if I was writing a standard today, I probably wouldn't be very pri privacy centric. That's just what people do. So as we're evaluating these, though, I think we need to be aware of that bias and be able to visualize. And that's what hopefully we're trying to do here in these graphs is be able to see how these line up. 
So again, I'm not going to give a lot of commentary on this, but I just, I want you to see, you'll have the data and you can choose how you're going to handle it. All right. So you can choose what you're going to do with that. The other thing that I did was I went through and we did Google trending on the individual standards. Now, the only thing about this particular graph is that this is, these are five-year graphs for Google trends, basically saying how interested are people in this topic? And it's not an exact science, right? It's just based on Google searches and some of the volume that comes through on the topic. And what it does is it's a sort of an interesting way to view or visualize people's interest on a subject. Now, when we're looking at this topic versus version eight, you're gonna see that they're the same graph because you can't distinguish versions in this particular search. I, I didn't find a good way to do that and separate the data. But what we'll see is that there's, again, it's just very spiky, right? So you see a lot of spikes in this and you can sort of see that normalized data sort of right around maybe, you know, 40% or so um, looking at over the last five years of interest in that topic. And you'll see others are gonna have sort of different shapes, which I think will be interesting for us to look at. But I, what we did was we took this information and then integrated it into this next score. And these were ultimately the scores that we gave for the particular standard. Now, these are gonna be the categories that we talked about earlier, right? So our governance controls included in that standard, our operational controls. And, and you look at this one, for example, you know, if I look at, let's say privacy controls, and you might look at it, you see as an F, right? So basically you don't get many points for an F. And you say, okay, wow, you know, the CIS controls really aren't very good on privacy. Like, why would you get an F? That's a really sort of bad score. Well, and, and remember, this is a project that I worked on, right? So this is near and dear to my heart. So I, I'm not trying to criticize people. It's just the, the reality is, is we didn't put any privacy controls in the standard. And if you go back to our graph, right, you'll see, I have a little red dot that almost looks like there's some data privacy controls. I actually put the, the graph to be like 1% just so that it would show near the zero because I didn't want it to be confusing to people. But literally when it's that low, it's literally just 0%, right? There are literally zero privacy controls in the CIS controls because that's not their not their scope. So it doesn't score very well, now, right? And that's fine. It, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean these people are horrible people. It just means that that wasn't their focus. And I just want us to be able to understand those biases and those differences because if we were trying to build a comprehensive program, I think that's something that needs to be considered. So that's where you see that. But you'll see other things like technical controls addressed, right? They, they've done a pretty good job. They're very technical standards. They get a pretty good grade on that. Um, it's a very community driven process. So they got an A on that, right? So you can kind of see those individual scores. So what I'm gonna do is I, I'm not gonna go through and read each of these two because frankly, I've got like 50 slides like this that, that I can go through. And a lot of this data, I want you to be able to process later. Uh, we are going to make a PDF of this available so you can see that. Uh, in fact, this morning, uh, a lot of this data, so the, the foundation of this data was actually already up on the audit scripts website for the past couple months. Um, but I went ahead and I, I replaced it with the PDF of these slides this morning. So again, if you go to auditscripts.com, uh, if you go to free resources, uh, collective risk project, at the very bottom of that page, you'll see a PDF you can download that has all this data in it. So again, you can use my scores or right, in, in our group scores, or you can go ahead and, and create your own, right? You can create new characteristics. You can give different scores if you don't like my scores. Remember, a big part of what I'm trying to introduce today is a methodology. I want you to get to think about how you might go about doing this research, okay? So again, if you have specific questions about any of these things, um, again, post those questions. Uh, what we're gonna do is we will put together a blog post later uh, that goes into more details on some of these things um, for the questions we're not able to address during the presentation today. I know we're gonna run out of time very quickly here today. But again, you can sort of see those overall scores that we have there. All right, so a couple of things here. So we'll look at a bunch of these other standards here too. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna highlight certain things um, and, and what we'll do is we'll use that just to give some flavors. Uh, and then what we'll do is um, if we have Q and A about any of those things, we can talk about that. But then I have a couple of follow-ups I wanna talk with you about as well. So give me another like 15, maybe 20 minutes and we'll, we'll sort of go through each of these individual standards. You can see what's here. And I'm gonna point out just a few things. The CIS controls version eight did change philosophy a little bit when it came to the controls themselves. You'll notice there are quite a few more governance controls and operational controls in V8 than in V7. Uh, and in fact, there's a statement in, in each of the 18 families now that is really sort of policy driven, uh, which is sort of a big ph philosophical change uh, in the way the controls were developed. The other thing you'll notice is some of the technical statements you'll notice have shrunk. So if I go back real quick over to version seven, you'll see you've got a number of those bars sort of pretty far on the right there. 
a lot of those bars shrank a little bit with V8 and some of the technical statements, they purposely pared back some of the statements and tried to make it shorter. Uh, that was actually a stated goal for version eight. So you're gonna see that, that changes a little bit. So you get a little bit more balance, I think, between the areas, um, trying to decide which controls to put into place. Um, and again, I think you see more of a focus here in version eight of sort of what I've observed to be more of a legislative baseline or people trying to define what are those bare minimum things people should do. Whereas originally, I think the philosophy was more, what are the hard things that companies could do to defend themselves and really stop attacks? This sort of was more, it's a nuance, but the nuance seems to be more focused on what is a standard baseline? What are the common things everybody think everyone should be doing? And some of those hard things got removed. So again, just a bit of a uh, philosophical change that, that went into that. Trending, again, identical to version seven. So I, I didn't try to make a distinction there. I, I don't know if that would be worth much, but again, that, that 30, 40% sort of baseline there that we see in place is kind of an interesting one. Also, again, you'll see some scores for this. Uh, a couple of scores changed. Um, we did lower the technical score um, for this one just a little bit, um, just because they did pull some of those out. Uh, we didn't change the governance and operation controls too much. Felt like it was pretty close, but they did address those, I think, a little bit more. Um, you'll see a couple of things as far as controls updated recently. Obviously, this is more recent than anything else we've seen. So they get probably one of the highest scores for controls being updated. This just came out in May of this year. Um, it certainly gets a lot of attention. Um, the tag for applicability, we scored a little bit lower on this one than version seven, only because a lot of their supplementary guidance hasn't been published yet. You'll also see that for the corresponding measures and metrics guides. Um, these are things that were all done in version seven that just, it's a timing issue. I'm sure they'll probably do these, um, but just version eight hasn't released those yet. So it's one of those things where as they release more guidance and do this again next year, those scores will probably go up. So um, I think the overall score you'll see is a bit different. It did go down, but I think that's probably more a reflection of timing and the number of resources put into the project because version seven has been around for so long, they have the advantage of time and more resources put out. So I think that's probably the biggest reason why you see those score change uh, that's there. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. So in, in my consulting practice or sort of where me and my team work, uh, a lot of times we're asked the question, okay, which standard should we use as a starting point? And it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I won't tell you the company, but one of the clients we worked with, um, we'd get in trouble if we talked about who, but one of the clients we worked with uh, was actually trying to make this decision about what standard to use. And what they, they were actually at a White House dinner. And the CEO of this company is a big tech company out in San Francisco. And anyway, so the big tech company sent their, their CEO went out to the White House for this dinner. And it was during the Obama administration, like just at the end of the administration there. And anyways, and so the president was actually sitting next to the CEO and they were talking a bit about um, cybersecurity standards and just cyber defense in general. And Obama was actually pretty knowledgeable, it turns out, about this topic. And it was actually one of his earlier priorities in the beginning of his administration. Well, anyways, and so they were talking about cybersecurity and Obama actually asked the CEO, he said, listen, you know, what are you all doing to defend yourself? Like what, what priorities do you guys have? And so they were just talking generically a little bit and the president said, well, you know, what, uh, what standards or do you follow? Like, do you have a particular standard that you like? Like, do you follow NIST or like, what are the things that the CSF or like, what are you doing? And I actually was quite knowledgeable about this stuff. And the CEO said, yeah, 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 yeah. We use NIST and, and those things. That's exactly right. And so anyway, they went, went on to talk about other things and CEO flies back to California and talks to their audit team. And that's where I was working and it tells us the story and says, listen, I just, just want to make sure that we're doing those things. Like, again, this is what we told the president. So I want to make sure I'm not lying. You know, or were those actually the things or these are things we're really doing? And audit team said, yeah, those are our priorities, but you know, we're actually using more of the CIS controls and probably a little less than NIST CSF and all that. But basically, yeah, we're doing those things. And the CEO said, oh, okay, good. Um, and by the way, what's NIST, right? And, and obviously just, he didn't want to look stupid in front of the president or you know, make it look like he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, really had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, really just didn't know not only the differences between these standards, but didn't know what even the standards themselves were, right? That was kind of an extreme situation. But what I find is, is a lot of us are aware of the name, but this is where we start talking about the CSF here, just as an example, is the differences between say this and the CIS controls. We don't recognize the differences that might be here. And this is where you can start to see all of a sudden a lot of really big shifts. So what do we see here? So we see the CSF has a strong, strong focus on security programs operations. But again, let me just back up a second here. So here's the CIS controls. Look at again sort of that technical distribution versus um, governance and operations. Again, look at what a stark difference that really is when we look at those. 
and look, I mean, frankly, I mean, if you want to keep it simple, look how much red we have, right? Or how many gaps and controls that we have in place. Now, granted, the cybersecurity framework was designed to be specifically created for critical infrastructure. It was last updated during the Obama administration, right? It's not a project that's been worked on since. Now, people might ask me, you know, is there going to be a new version of the CSF? I don't know. This might be the end, right? This might be the only version that comes out. But it's been a number of years um, since we've seen a big update to this, and just something you probably need to be aware of. Google Trends, again, very similar to the CIS controls. And you see a spike back in um, 18 and earlier, because that's when a lot of the focus was on the CSF. So you see a bit more interest back in those days, um, sort of on the left side of the graph. And again, you can sort of see, if you, if you look at averages here, there's definitely a downward trend. Uh, so you don't see quite as much interest in the CSF or people doing searches on the CSF today as you might have seen maybe three, four years ago. So something to be aware of, right? Sort of a downward trend in that sense. Uh, but again, you can see some scores that are there. Obviously, they're going to score a little bit better on governance and operations, probably not so well on technical. Um, they are a closed process. They take some feedback, or at least they did during the, the initial process. But ultimately, the decisions were sort of a closed decision based on other standards. Um, there's a little bit of mapping going on, not a lot of mapping, um, uh, especially not on the threat side. But there, are, there is some detailed mapping if you open the guide itself. So you, they've definitely got some points there. But the, the threat side, really not a lot there. And you don't see a lot of the supplemental resources um, that are in place. So again, maybe not so good of a score there. Um, and we'll look at the overall scores and how they compare here in just a minute. So the other one, of course, that's getting a lot of attention right now is the um, cybersecurity um, maturity model certification, um, the CMMC. Um, certainly, this is getting a ton of attention right now, and especially if you looked at some of the, the Pentagon reports that came out over the last week or two, uh, those are even more interesting, sort of changing the standard and sort of altering how this versus 801 and new one are going to be applied, um, really require actual certification, self-accreditation, so all these things are sort of up in the air right now, but that'd be an interesting thing for all of us to keep an eye on. Notice again, sort of a balanced standard, again, a little bit more technically oriented, a little less governance focused, but has a little bit of operations thrown in there. So some of the CSF concepts, right, are definitely here. Notice though, what I thought was interesting was network device protection. We see more and more standards not addressing network devices. That was something that surprised me going through this. I didn't realize how few standards actually address network devices. It's almost like they sort of put it under the umbrella of systems in general, right? So they might say, patch your systems. And a lot of times we think, okay, workstation servers, but there's no specific statement that actually says, you know what, you should keep your network devices up to date too. It's almost like that's a gap. And in fact, you find that gap in most all the standards. I was actually surprised to find that. Um, the other one, of course, is the secure software development. That's just a whole area of research that we're going to, as a community, have to address at some point. All the standards uh, seem to really um, leave that out. In fact, you're going to find that really under subcategories, there's really only two subcategories for secure software development, looking at a secure SDLC process and looking at um, uh, code scanning. Those are really the only the two main areas that are addressed in that area. Most all standards do poorly at that. Um, at some at some point, I've been thinking maybe in future versions to maybe add that in as an actual criteria. Um, but I feel like, again, everyone would probably do bad on that. So that's something kind of like privacy. So that's something in the future we're going to probably have to, as an industry, address. I feel like that's a, a gap that we haven't addressed at this point. Notice, of course, very different graph, right? Certainly CMMC wasn't a thing five years ago. So you don't see any interest in this whatsoever. You definitely see sort of this um, underlying murmur uh, about this. I think this is a decent certification or a decent standard that we have out here. Um, but certainly relatively new. So certainly on the right-hand side, it's getting a little bit more attention. But again, you know, hovering around that 30 number there. So again, a little bit of a spike. It'll be very interesting over the coming years, next probably year or two, to see where this, how this changes. Uh, I think you're going to see an increase of conversations about this, um, but it might not be as high as I thought it was going to be based on some of the changes that the Pentagon is pushing out right now. So again, you can see sort of the distribution that's there. Again, sort of like the CSF, um, very, it has the technical controls, not a lot of privacy controls, uh, and not a lot of supplemental guidance yet. Uh, that's sort of a work in progress still, still a lot of work coming out, um, bringing that into the conversation. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that gets released here in future years. But again, you'll also see a lot of these NIST, CMMC uh, guides. They're, they're not as internationally accepted. So those, those of you coming from outside the US and listening in, I know a lot of you are probably using some of the standards, um, but it's it's not used as widely. So again, we're going to see not quite as much adoption on that NIST side. And that kind of goes along with 800-171. 
Um, a lot of you know 800 is part of CMMC. So what I did was I used the higher levels of CMMC for the earlier graph. And this is for sort of those base levels, you know, level one and three, uh, if you've done that kind of research. So again, 800-171 rev two is a foundational piece of level three CMMC. But if I go back here, you'll see, again, we've got some of the controls listed a little bit higher. That's because I looked at the higher levels for the full CMMC slide here. And then for 800-171, these were the lower controls or sort of the, the lower um, bar that was set. Um, and again, you can, this is sort of more in line, I would say, with what we saw with the CIS controls version eight, trying to understand what is a baseline, what's a foundational side of things, um, sort of the bare minimum things basically that organizations should be considering. And again, you'll see software development really doesn't show up. They got a little bit of privacy here. And again, look at network device protection. Again, it just that one really jumps out at me when, when I look at these standards, that it's not just CMMC, but 800-171 is real light on this. And I remember a conversation with Homeland Security a few years ago when we were talking about the CIS controls and they had actually pushed pretty heavily for us to remove a lot of those statements about network device protection, which I thought was interesting and I didn't understand back in the day. Uh, but you can clearly see that a lot of these standards really don't address that. So I thought that was of course an area of concern to me to be aware of. Again, you can see trending there. This has been around a little bit longer. Again, sort of a um, earlier years, you know, back before 18, you know, back in the 17 timeframes and such that, you know, certainly you don't see quite as much attention, but, you know, a little bit of information about this going forward. Uh, and again, you can see some of our scores. I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but again, you can read these after the fact. In addition to that, I wanted to make sure, of course, we put ISO 27002 here. Uh, notice that we do have the 2013 version. Uh, what it turns out is this is also, like the CSF, a very operationally focused standard. And what surprised me on 27002 was how strong secure software development was. Like, I, I was honestly surprised. I've always had sort of a bad taste in my mouth about 27002. But the more that I really looked, looked at the data here, the more I felt like if I had to pick a software development standard, this might be one of the better, if not the best standards we have for the purpose of software development. So just something to keep in mind, a lot of times I think we, we look at these standards as good and bad, and you know, we like this one, but we don't like that one, but we miss the opportunity to pull sort of nuggets and good things out of those standards. And what I like here about 2002, which was pleasantly surprising, was just how much focus they had on secure software development. They did cover a good percent of that, and obviously very operationally focused. The flip side of this, what concerns me certainly, is, well, how does this relate to technical defense? Uh, certainly, if you're looking for a technical standard, this is probably not the one to go with, uh, which concerns me because as I look internationally, I see more conversations about this than a lot of others. Uh, it's been interesting to me, to me probably the last two or three years that I've had a lot of international conversations and probably more interest internationally for the Center for Net Security's controls, the CIS controls, than even within the U.S. Now, to be fair, a lot of U.S. organizations jumped on that bandwagon years ago. But it was interesting to me the last couple of years, people, people have been telling me that they're looking for something very specifically technical to augment their existing programs, many of which were based on the original ISO standards that uh, came from the British government and Shell Oil and some of those conversations. So it's, it's interesting to see um, some organizations more and more talking to me about ISO sort of merged with uh, CIS controls as a strategy. A lot of non-US companies have been, have been having uh, almost like what 800171 did with the CIS controls in order to create CMMC. So just kind of an interesting pairing, but obviously not a very technically oriented control we see here. A lot of conversation about this. this has been sort of steady state, right? You see a lot of spikes on this, maybe about a 40%, let's say 40, 45% um, trend for years. But notice in 19, you definitely start to see a bit of a slide, very, very similar to what we saw with the CSF. So you can see that tailing the slide to the right really um, maybe lack of applicability and people wondering about how useful this really is. I'm very thankful to see that ISO is going to put out a new version. I've seen some of the drafts of it. I'm a little concerned that it's, it's not going to change scope enough, um, that it still might be very similar in a graph to what we see here, but I am at least glad to see that they're going to put out an update. So it looks like possibly next year we can see that and keep an eye on that, but uh, that'll be something that we can look at uh, next year. And you know, fingers crossed it's something that's worthwhile. Uh, and again, you can see some of our scores that are there. Definitely they score better on governance and operations than a lot of these other ones do. Um, they actually do a decent job on the governance side as well, uh, if I didn't mention that one. But again, you know, we, we look at like, for example, specifically addressing modern threats or mapping threats to controls. Pretty much everyone is doing bad on mapping threats to controls. Uh, that's just not something that anyone is publishing. 
And, and you might ask people, James, you know, are people actually doing that? Like, are these standards bodies? You know, do they have these maps behind the scenes and they're just not sharing them with us? You know, the reality is, is no. And so I, I know we'd all love to think that people are, but they're not. Um, mapping threats to controls is very hard. It's a many to one relationship kind of thing. And sometimes a many to many relationship kind of mapping. And they're very painful to do. I've, I've had to do a few of them over the years and they're not simple. And as a result, most people just don't do them. Some other ones that we have here too, I'll go through these a little bit faster here, but we see PCI. Uh, again, you can see this sort of taking a bare minimum approach, definitely a little more technically oriented. But also though, this is more about compliance, more about things that must be done. So you would almost expect these numbers, these bars to be all a little bit lower because, because again, this is meant to be a low bar that everyone is over. So we wanna make sure our people at least over a particular bar and, and that's what you see with PCI. So it's not all that surprising that you see that the bar is the number so low. Uh, some of them are a little surprising, you know, looking at like acid inventory and some of those, but again, not all that unusual just given the nature of PCI and its scope. Again, pretty steady, uh, actually a little bit higher, I would say even maybe on the 50% mark, maybe a little bit higher than that uh, of interest over the years. And this has been just a steady conversation with people needing to be compliant with this over the last few years. And again, you can see some of our scores for that area as well. Um, many of you are aware of HIPAA and in the US, uh, the healthcare rule, kind of one of the oldest of the standards that's out there. Uh, this has been around since the late 90s and originally proposed in 1996. And actually um, people were held accountable to this in 2000, 2001. So uh, this has been around probably longer than anything else. And a lot of people will ask me, you know, when, when we look at HIPAA specifically and how it relates to healthcare, uh, we still get some conversations of people asking, you know, what are those requirements? And I, I try to explain to people that the requirements in HIPAA obviously are quite vague and quite short. Uh, and again, it was people's first attempt at putting something out there. So at least it was something, right? So give, give them credit for doing that back in the day. But you can see how it scores against the standard. And if healthcare organizations are only using HIPAA, or maybe you throw HIPAA and high tech in there, if that's all that's really being done to secure healthcare organizations, especially clinical facilities, um, that scares me to death, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and hopefully you can see why um, by looking at the security rule that's there. Um, and again, those lower items, you know, asset inventory, network device protection, those and lower. I know it may look like there's something there, um, but remember those really, really tiny bars mean 0%. I just, I wanted there to be some representation so you could at least see that I didn't miss that. Um, but those are really just 0% is what we see there. So very, very minimal controls uh, are being asked of HIPAA. Um, and again, you can see a steady state of conversations. I mean, people have been interested in this and you know, doing some Google trends about it. It doesn't surprise me. Um, but you can see this one definitely scored uh, a little bit on the lower side um, based on some of those problems that we just addressed. Um, another one, interesting one, COBIT. Um, this is from ISACA, uh, Control Objectives for Information Related Technologies. Uh, of course, is what COBIT stands for. This was always designed to be a governance framework. Uh, so if you were to ask COBIT, hey, COBIT, should I patch my systems? Or hey, COBIT, should I do application control? Uh, th that they were never designed to give you that answer. They would tell you, do a risk assessment, decide what controls are appropriate. And they tried to lay out a model for governing, um, uh, for how governance might be uh, applied in the setting. So I, I think there's some, some nuggets we can pull from governance here. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't hear many organizations referencing as much as they used to. Uh, it, it has been updated somewhat recently within the last five years or so. Uh, but again, we see a lot of gaps in this space, and it really is only on the government side you see any controls that are there. Uh, again, you see a little bit of an uptick in the last year or so, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure what that comes from, um, what people are looking into there. Uh, that might just be you know, some trending or good marketing on ISACA's part. I'm not exactly sure. Nothing against this here. It just, I, again, it's, it's a very small subset of the overall scope of controls in a comprehensive program that I'd be looking at. So again, you see a lot of these reflected here, and not, not a lot of... Um, not a lot of guidance sort of along with that supplemental resources like we had looked at with some of these other standards. Uh, so you can see how that lines up. The, the last one that we have here is MITRE. Uh, if we look at some of the MITRE controls, MITRE has what they call their enterprise mitigations. And I do expect that uh, we'll be looking at some of the defend items uh, down the road. Uh, but right now, at least, I, I don't really have, because it is in beta, I didn't want to do it of a, the beta standard, but once they publish that 100%, we'll include that in our research and ensure in the 2022 edition, we'll go ahead and include that as well. Um, but you can see these are really designed to be a bit more technical and they're designed to be prioritized and they're designed to be mapped against MITRE attack threats that they've observed. So the idea is you look at attack, what are the bad things that could happen? 
And then what are the controls that could stop those threats from being realized? These are the controls that miters identify. And so this is an evolving um, version. So you don't have hard and fast versions like you have some of the others that are there. Um, there wasn't enough data for this, so interestingly enough. And that doesn't surprise me. This is a, a lot of people I've talked to don't realize that MITRE has this capability there. So there wasn't enough data to really create a graph for this. So that's not completely surprising. It does score the, the trending a little bit lower, but it's an interesting project for sure. I, I like especially that it's mapped against threats. So if you'll see in the center there, mapping threats to controls, it's one of the very few that does that. And it is addressing these modern threats that they've identified in the past. So I think there's a lot of benefit for us being aware of this. But obviously, their, their priority hasn't been traditionally to be a control library. So some of the other ones don't score quite as well. But they do very, very well at those center areas that I just mentioned. Now, the, the, just to compare it against the baseline, this is the what I'll call completely unfair slide, right? <laughs> As you can imagine. Um, of course, right, the collective control catalog was the baseline that we used. Um, and so, of course, all the controls that are in there, I mean, it's going to look very green. And like I said, this is a completely unfair slide. So I always want to preface this slide with just the reality that the reason these score so well as far as coverage is because this was the baseline. And we specifically created this to be able to be used as a baseline. So, I mean, certainly maybe that's a positive thing, maybe it's not, but I just, I, that's why, of course, this is completely skewed compared to all the other standards that are out there. It's not to say that these are all the good things we could be doing. What we're actually looking forward to in future versions of this project is to go through and add more controls than are in the other standards. Because we think that there's things like software development or privacy where there really could be a lot of other controls that nobody's talking about that we might want to include into our control libraries. So over time, hopefully this will grow and we'll identify some of those gaps. Um, but right now, of course, this is all inclusive of all of the controls from all of those other standards that are out there. But again, th this has only been out since May, and there really just isn't enough data um, to really compare this Google trend-wise. So um, looking at international adoption, those sort of things, certainly it's not going to score very well because, again, it's, it's very, very new. Uh, and so you wouldn't expect there to be a whole lot of data uh, on this. Um, we haven't done anything on you know, corresponding measures guide yet. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that, that don't do well here. But the, the sort of the nice thing about this and kind of what my intention is, is to use the characteristic list we see here as we engage that project, because again, I'm a part of this project, is we're gonna use this as a checklist to be able to say, okay, what are those areas where we feel like we could improve what's going on here? And you'll notice on some of these areas like operational controls and privacy controls, you know, even though we look back here and we see all green bars, you'll notice I still scored Bs under operational and privacy controls because I feel like we could improve those still. So I didn't want to give full credit for that because I felt like there's still more to be more to be gained there. Um, the governance controls I feel pretty good about. Like we, we did a lot of research on that and actually have already added and filled some gaps there. Um, and the technical controls, I think, you know, maybe be a, you know, certainly we could improve those maybe a little bit like any standard, we hope to improve it, but obviously all inclusive of the other statements that are out there. Um, this is relatively recent, but we also are not releasing our threat to control mapping. Uh, that's something we hope to do. Uh, we want to take the open threat taxonomy. We're in the process of rebranding that uh, to be the collective threat taxonomy. And our intention is we are going to, as we release a new version of that, we will release our threat mapping, but that's not out yet. So that's on our list. And eventually, right, that score will be better. But for right now, it's not very good. Um, same with the metrics guide. Uh, we, we know we need to do that still. Um, that's under development right now. Um, but once the metrics guide is done, then maybe we can score a little bit better in that area. But we're going to try to chip away at these because we feel like these are important things that any control standard would want to put into place. So this is a slide I think a lot of you are probably looking for at the end of the day. And this is the one, um, Russell Eubanks, one of the, the folks who's on my team, uh, who has been involved with CIS controls and a bunch of other projects at SANS and other things. Um, he, he, made, he made the comment to you this morning. He said, James, you, you probably are going to get fewer Christmas cards this year um, because of uh, this content, and specifically uh, this slide here. So I apologize in advance. And, you know, again, I, I probably have lost a couple, couple Christmas cards um, by, by putting this data out there. It, it, the, the one I think that probably surprised me the most on this list, because I, I didn't go in with any expectations. I just ran the data and let it say what it said. I really didn't expect the CSF to have that low of a score. That one surprised me. I thought that one would be higher. Um, I, it just is what it is. I mean, I, we talked about the commentary. You can look at how what led into that score um, in the earlier slides, but that one definitely shocked me. I was not expecting that at all. Um, 
I was expecting a little bit of a dip between version 7.1 and 8 of the CIS controls, but I would expect next year when we have this conversation that that score will go up um, because they'll have those supplemental guides probably published at that point. So I'm guessing that score is going to go up a little bit. Um, CMMC, I thought would be higher too. Uh, that one surprised me a little bit. I was thinking like C plus, B minus maybe, but um, a little bit lower there than I thought. HIPAA, I actually thought would be lower. So that one kind of surprised me. I thought that would be worse. I actually thought COVID would be worse. Uh, but, you know, kind of interesting to see how that all plays out. So this methodology is going to be followed year after year. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not going to change things. Um, to address a couple questions that are there um, that I've seen come in the Q&A, um, we, we didn't try to do everybody. We didn't try to include every single standard here. So if there's a standard you really, really want considered, let me know. It doesn't mean we're going to do it, but I'll at least have you on the radar, and you'll probably at least be in the big mapping to create the baseline. But we'll have to decide sort of where the most popular to include in the survey. Um, but that'll be sort of a year by year thing we'll decide. I also really would like it if anyone comes up with ideas for criteria you'd like considered. Um, I'm more than happy to do that. We also didn't do any weighting this year. We might weight it more next year. We just kept it equal this year and we'll decide how to address that going forward. Um, but at least for right now, uh, we decided to leave everything as equal there. So just kind of an FYI. Uh, but again, those are our overall scores. Um, a couple things I would say going forward from this, some things that I would have you consider uh, in, the, in the time we have left. We, we talked about this idea of prioritization. And I mentioned to you that a lot, of, a lot of the standards don't do prioritization. Very, very few actually do this. In the collective controls, we did prioritize. And it's in the spreadsheet. If you go ahead and download that spreadsheet, uh, as you see, Rob Johns has, has piped in and actually given you the link there uh, in the Q&A window. So if, if you want to look in the Q&A window, you'll see the link there to be able to download this. But we wanted to give you those priorities. So if you decide you like the baseline approach that we have here and you're looking for those priorities, we did go ahead and publish that. Uh, so we'll keep that up to date with future versions of the project as well. Um, but I just wanted you to be aware that we are trying to solve some of those challenges as a part of that project. And there is a scoring tool available for you as well. I know a lot of you uh, who are listening here have been a part of our SANS classes or maybe are aware of the audit script resources that are out there. Uh, but what we did was we um, we we been putting out tools, Excel tools for doing scoring against control libraries. Uh, we have one for the CIS controls. I know that we've got thousands of downloads for every year. So we did make one for the collective controls as well. So if you want to go ahead and use that as part of your um, uh, scoring tool process, or if you're doing a self-assessment or something and you want to use those tools, this one's a little bit bigger than the one we've used for the CIS controls because there's, there's 400 questions as opposed to like 150 or whatever in the CIS controls. So the questions, the Q&A is a little bit longer, um, but hopefully it's sort of a little more comprehensive because we do include, for example, the government scores, which um, really aren't in the CIS scoring tools that are out there that we've released in the past. So again, our goal is we want to keep working with the standard, the framework, the collector controls. That's a project we're going to continue on. Uh, we'll at least release at least one version uh, updated next year, possibly two. Uh, we've been debating that. We might release two versions next year. Um, we're also going to try to do a repeat of this webcast every year. Uh, so we were actually talking even this morning a little bit of kind of when the best time of the year to do it and those sort of things, but expect going forward that we'll keep this data up to date and that we'll rescore everything. And so we, we want to be able to make this as a reference. So hopefully you can download the PDF and have access to the, the rough data that's there. And then you can also use this. Um, there will be a recording of this that we'll post up on YouTube so you can refer colleagues to this if you guys are trying to make a decision. But ideally, this will be a, a conversation we can all be a part of. It, it's meant to be something that gets better and gets improved. So as you're thinking about this, if you come up with criteria, if you come up with standards you want us to consider, tell us, and we'll build that into the research. And year by year, we'll just present what we find. We're not trying to be biased. I mean, I'm sure we have our biases that we always do, but we're going to try to be as uh, sort of realistic and just sort of open-minded and give you just raw information so we can all make good decisions and try to decide where should we be focusing our time and what are the good things we should be doing to better defend ourselves. That's sort of the, the goal of this. I always give you some call for action, uh, just things to think about. Uh, if you don't already have a chartered program for cybersecurity, I really encourage you to consider that. If you haven't formally decided what cybersecurity controls that you need to have and sort of what their present state are, we'd always have you sort of start there and then figure out where the gaps are and, and try to address those critical controls first. But I try to leave you with some action items just to give you something to think about. I'm also gonna leave you with my contact information. Uh, I know we don't have time to address a lot of the questions that are there, 
Um, we, just to answer a couple very quickly, we do not have a privacy standard scorecard, um, frankly, because there are so few privacy standards out there. Um, if you're looking for one today, we've been pointing everyone to the NIST standard. So the NIST privacy framework is probably about the best you're gonna get right now, but that might be something in the future we could include in this. So a place to sort of get you started there. Um, it's like IEC 62443, sort of in the list there. Uh, we have not included that. Um, just simply because we we just didn't have it on our list as sort of priorities here, but not to say we couldn't include it in future versions. Um, there certainly may be others we want to include, um, including ANR 53, uh, which is one we've not done. So um, that might be a good one to sort of put into this as well, just because there's a lot of conversations about that. What I will do is I'll, we'll go ahead and we'll publish a blog post to follow up and I'll answer all the questions that have come through the Q&A in a blog post and we'll put those up at the SANS site. Uh, that way we can hopefully answer everyone's questions. But if you have more questions, more than just what's in the Q&A, please send me an email. Um, do me a favor in the subject line, put like SANS webcast or something so I don't miss it or it doesn't go to my junk or something like that. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and, uh, and email me, uh, we'll be more than happy to include answers to the questions in a blog post um, and point everybody to that post. So that way, everybody gets the benefit of the questions that come in, not just one or two people. So really appreciate you being here today. We're thankful that you can be here, part of the SANS presentations. You know, a lot of us are trying to put some of this research out there to give you some tools and research, and we hope that they help you out um, as you're going forward with your cybersecurity efforts. Thanks for being here today and look forward to seeing you hopefully on a future SANS webcast. Thank you so much, James, for your great presentation. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For schedule of all upcoming and archived webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.